So what we're talking about here today is this house welcomes the rise of the robots in education. So this house welcomes the rise of the robots in education. So if we can have the poll up, please, you can either vote for the motion by clicking A, against B, and if you're undecided, C. And you now have 15 seconds to do that. Yeah, yes. And of course, we're not just going to be using this. We will do the same thing at the end, after the speakers have spoken, after you've been able to ask questions, and we will see how the vote will go then. So we've got four, 49%, against 32%, and undecided, 19%. So I would like now to invite Professor Justine Cassell to start the argument for our four camp. So first, I'd like to start out by thanking our speaker of the house for her masterful job at moderating this session. I'd like to express my esteem for my opponents, although I do have to say that I fear that their debating skill will obscure the facts in this case. So, my job is to argue that robots should increase their presence in the classroom. And it's an easy argument to make. And the argument I'm going to make is that they should replace teachers. As all of the documents about the fourth industrial revolution have shown, robots have become smarter than humans, they've become quicker than humans, and they have a better ability to sense and to be connected to other artifacts than uh, humans. So for example, robots are much better than teachers at sensing who is on Facebook rather than taking notes, a very important skill. They can acquire all of the knowledge in the world and download it efficiently and effectively into the, the minds of students. Or maybe not. Maybe that's not what we want in our classrooms, although policymakers seem to sometimes treat teachers as robots. I don't actually believe that robots should ever replace teachers. I think there's a far more important role for robots in the classroom, and that is as a support for the teacher's skill. And I'm going to give you some examples. And for each point, I'll give you some scientific evidence behind it that there should be more robots in the classroom to help teachers increase learning gains in their students. For example, robots are ideal as moderators and mediators for small group learning. Research by Dr. Carolyn Rose shows that with the presence of a robot as mediator, children come out of small groups with higher learning gains than they do with a human moderator or without any moderator. Robots can be ideal as peer collaborators when children are working on tasks, for example, when children are doing science. Uh, of course, we know that Piaget says that learning happens best when there's cognitive conflict, that children, um, cognitive conflict in the sense that children have one belief and another person has another belief, but it only works when the other person is another child. And so peer robots can induce cognitive conflict, absence of certainty about one's belief, and therefore change. And my own research has shown that better than other children, peer robots are able to increase learning gains in proto-literacy skills, for example. There should be more robots that act as younger peers, since, as Vygotsky has shown with the zone of proximal development, when children teach younger children, they learn better than when they study themselves for a test. Not when they study themselves, but when they themselves study for a test. And uh, many of you, I hope, have seen the demonstration of this by Pierre Dillenberg from EPFL out in the future zone, 
He has a robot that children teach to write and to read. What's extraordinary about it is that the children are teaching the robot their own mistakes, because that's what they know. And then they're curing the robot of those mistakes, and thereby curing themselves of those mistakes. It's extraordinary work. And others have done similar work. Uh, Dan Schwartz, for example, at Stanford has done similar work on teachable agents. There should be more robots, finally, that arrive in the classroom in little pieces, in a kit that children put together, and thereby learn to program. And we have a lovely example of that in the Future Zone with the Finch, developed by Dr. Illa Nurbash, which is currently being used in every classroom in the GEMS Nation Academy, Nations Academy. Uh, one girl said yesterday when she was showing her work, so it's actually children who have built the Finch who are showing their work, who are demonstrating the work. And one, one girl yesterday showed off with great pride a robot that was simulating a cornfield. And when asked whether she had learned more about robotics than about corn, she said she had learned about robotics, about corn, and about all of life. So actually, there's one last point I want to make. In my own research, I, I always forget to cite, um, Samantha Finkelstein, my student, is showing a virtual peer that teaches socio-emotional skills. So it's not just STEM skills that robots can teach. It's also cell skills, and that's very important. There are ways in which robots, as I've shown, can teach social skills to children with Asperger's and high-functioning autism, and those skills then transfer. They show a transfer effect, that magical holy grail of a transfer effect, such that those children are better, more sophisticated in their social interaction with other children afterwards. So remember that parents feared some time ago, that the printing press would destroy education. And there was an uprising against that printing press because children would no longer remember anything. Today, I think we'd be thrilled if our children used books rather than their cell phones. So in sum, robots should rise up in the classroom. But the role they minute. play is up to us. Let us not abdicate responsibility let us make sure that our policymakers keep robots in their place, which is as a support to the skill of teachers. Let us increase the number of those robots and use them in the way they should be used, what Piaget and Seymour Papert called objects to think with. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK. Uh, we've had a compelling four arguments, um, and Michael has also arrived, but I would like to ask um, Brett van Leeuwen uh, to give us his view on the counter-argument, please. Well, let me start by saying that I, I welcome the rise of, um, of the robots, even though the question seems more oriented to transformers than to transformation. And actually, I would have difficulties speaking against the motion if in the explanatory note, and I recommend that you read this explanatory note very carefully, um, it was argumented that advancing robotics would help us overcoming the looming global teacher shortage. Um, I, I, believe, I do believe that technology, first of all, should be seen as a valuable teaching and learning aid, uh, and not to overcome teacher shortages, not to increase class sizes, let alone replace teachers even when we are able to develop the most advanced robots with how many? Two, three, four, five senses. Um, smarter than all of us combined here in this, uh, in this room, they will not ever substitute for the human interaction that requires teaching and learning. 
it would be easy <clears throat> to paint educators as stuck in the past, while the brave innovators uh, struggle to free students from their withered grasp. But let's look at what we know. First, there is, I believe, no profession more ambitiously open source than teaching. Teachers use all the technology they can lay their hands on to improve their teaching and to improve their students' learning. But please, let's not get ahead of ourselves. And let me make two remarks. Uh, first remark, the OECD showed us in 2012 that virtually all 15-year-old students in OECD countries had a computer at home, but less than three quarters um, were using a computer or tablet at school. And in some countries, it was fewer than half. Now, you would think, great, the answer is more computers, more and better computers. But students who used computers very frequently at school actually fared much worse in most learning outcomes. Again, according to the OECD. They found that the more intensively students use computer at school, the less digital literate they seem to be, even <clears throat> after accounting for social background and student uh, demo de demographics. And the results also showed no improvements in learning outcomes in those countries that invested most heavily in digital technology in schools. What we find too often, ladies and gentlemen, is a sort of island effect where technology products are dropped on school systems and classrooms, things like tablets, e-readers, computers, whiteboards, smart boards, and now also robots. Amazing products, of course, uh, but it has not had the kind of positive impact we would have expected. And in some cases, where, for example, children get too much what they call screen time, it's had a negative impact. Now my second remark. In 2010, edu edu uh, education tech startups uh, raised less than $400 million. And in 2015, it was nearly $2 billion. And as we live in the age of acceleration, according to Mr. Friedman this morning, it may be four to eight million today. The organization at Surge said there are nearly 4,000 math and reading apps, classroom management systems, and other software services. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a lot of market pressure. Still, none of us doubts the importance of tech. Just look at Gordon Brown's Education uh, Commission report from last year. They said technology offers huge opportunities to improve learning, expand participation, and increase efficiency. And I fully agree. But they also said that for investments in digital learning to be cost-effective, technology must be sufficiently interlinked with curriculum development, teacher training, and pedagogical methods. So again, let's not get ahead of ourselves. We believe that education is, first of all, a social enterprise that hinges on building deep conceptual understanding and higher order thinking, and that very much depends on high quality teacher-student interaction. If we want students to become smarter than their smartphones, we need to think very clearly about what, about how, and, uh, and about who we want to teach them. One minute about where to find the millions of professionals we will need in the next 20 years, about the best pedagog pedagogies, the best tools, and the best learning environments that can help us improve outcome. Technology can amplify great teaching, but great technology will never make up for inadequate teaching or for teachers' shortages. Teachers should lead the use of technology in their classroom, rather than the other way around, the technology leading the teacher. 
This Ten seconds. It's simple. Where, where resources are scarce, we would give priority to investing in the recruitment and training of those great teachers that we need, rather than placing our bets on technology as an answer to teacher shortages. So I urge you to vote no to the proposition. Thank you very much. Could I ask Sir Michael? Uh, ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, is that microphone on, please? Pick it up, maybe pick it up this time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, this, uh, this motion makes uh, the assumption that the robots have uh, <laughs> not already risen, um, but they have. The robots have already risen and have been evident in our education system, in our schools, for many, many years. And most of us in this room, not all of us, but most of us in this room can recognize the robots that have been in our schools for many years. Let me, let me remind you of some of the robots that I've seen and, and that you've seen. One of the earliest and the clunkiest of robots, when you, char when you charge it up, it says in very Dalek fashion, I've always done it this way. I don't need to be told. I don't need any help or training. Sorry about the Dalek type uh, uh, accent. I don't need any help or training. If these children don't learn, it's their fault, not my fault. These robots are more often found in grammar schools and rely heavily on programming chips brought, bought by their parents to upgrade their systems. Then there is Robot 2, who you will also recognize. This robot needs constant servicing and oiling. Otherwise, it whines a lot at a high pitch with the other Daleks. It never looks bright and shiny, but screeches a lot and says things like workload, pressure, Ofsted. It's a very miserable looking robot who likes to keep the company of other similar robots in what is known as the grand union of robots. <laughs> there is also, though, the smart new Apple Mac robot who whistles and whirs, lights up, and is a joy to behold. Young people love this robot, go home and say to their mums and dads, I've had a good day in my bright new smart and shiny <coughs> robot, and I wish there were more of them in my school. Then, of course, we have the big powerful robot, the senior principal robot. This is a robot which is kept in a storeroom and only comes out occasionally. When it does, people say things like, is that the principal robot? To which comes the answer usually, I believe it is, but I'm not sure. I've never seen it in the classroom or wheeled down the corridors. The senior robot, though, loves being dusted off now and again and regularly being wheeled out of the school to attend jolly working parties, principal robot round, round tables, and robot conferences. When this robot returns to the cupboard, people say, it's back in the cupboard again, but we didn't miss it, did we? But others say, the principal robot enjoys being in a cupboard because it doesn't like showing that it's not working that well. The shinier version of this new robot says things like personalized learning, every child matters, distributive leadership, and blah, blah, and is programmed by none other than the government. This robot looks and is very flashy, but falls apart very quickly 
because the government program keeps changing and confusing the senior robot, who then has to go off and be reprogrammed in the factory called the Common Sense Factory for Senior Robots. The smartest and shiniest of all the senior robots is the one who loves being outside the cupboard, loves being with the other computers, and has a microchip which allows it to solve problems, multitask, and adapt to different situations. This really smart senior robot re works really well with the smart Apple junior robot. They both go out of their way to make and develop lots of other smart robots. Both robots, senior and junior, are in great schools and understand they can help and support children through One online minute. learning, video conferencing, data collection, digital communication, whiteboard technology, and a range of back office administrative functions. Both robots, senior and junior, also know their limitations. They would much rather be in the hands of people and teachers who know how to use them well. And these robots are very conscious that nothing can replace human interaction and motivation. So vital in all learning, but particularly for those children who do not have the technological and family infrastructure to support them. The rise of robots or new technology is simply the story of human progress and is nothing to fear in the classroom or elsewhere. Labor-saving technology makes people more productive and productivity in teaching ultimately benefits children and young people by improving pedagogy and cutting down on unnecessary bureaucracy and administration. Ten seconds. Robots will never replace teachers, but they make the robotic teacher and leader a much, much better one. Thank you for supporting this motion. Thank you very much, Sir Michael. I would like now to invite Estella, one of our finalist teachers, to um, share her view with you, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'd like to start by thanking everyone here and thanking my partner and my opponents. Um, I am not a musician. I am not a singer. I can't read a note, and my asthma makes it quite difficult to play horns. Um, but in middle school, Mr. Brown, my teacher, gave me a CD, Lucy Pearl. I don't know if you're familiar with, with American music, um, but it was on my birthday, and it was my first CD, and the first album I got to listen to all the way through. Um, with that album, I discovered music. My relationship with art blossomed into something beyond words. It was an awakening. I serve as a theater arts and English teacher. And that moment with Mr. Brown, a catalyst for me to begin that journey. Um, a single moment of inspiration, one of many, and a priceless exchange between a teacher and his young pupil. <clears throat> that opened up a world of, of art for me that eventually led me to the stage. Like I said, I am not a musician, but music is what changed my life. Sure, a robot can assist in teaching skills, but a robot cannot inspire, nor can it love the subject that it's teaching, nor can it love the pupils before it. Inspiration and love are cultivated as are relationships among human beings. The classroom is a social environment. Piaget and Vygotsky were mentioned earlier and they would all attest to this truth. No longer are classrooms ruled by the stale teacher to student paradigm, as we've learned here while at this conference, I'm, I'm assuming. More and more classroom models encourage student-centered learning and working student-teacher relationships. Together, they can engender an environment where inspiration, love, and learning are not mutually exclusive but are the imperative and the cultural norm. Thus, learning is experiential as opposed to information-driven. 
<clears throat> the relationships derived at schools are significant to a child's development. Most would agree that our parents are our first teachers, which we heard in our keynote this morning at the plenary. So I ask you, would you replace your parents with robots? Our role as educators extends beyond the classroom and it bleeds deep into our communities that we serve. What do you teach? I'm asked often. I've been asked all week. And my response is typically, I teach students because those kids are far more important than any content area. Teaching is personal. It is empathetic, it is compassionate, it is inspiring, and it it's tender, it's multifaceted, it's multidimensional. A teacher is a counselor, a coach, a mentor, a nurse, and a parent, and often we are all those things at the same time. Traits not typically equated with robots. Our ability to simultaneously navigate knowledge and emotional intelligence is paramount and cannot be replaced. Dr. Martin Luther King once said, intelligence plus character is the goal of true education. My character, my moral compass, what brought me to the classroom and why I've devoted my life to service was developed by those teachers who trusted me those teachers who empowered me, those teachers who believed in me, the teachers who loved me, the teachers who nurtured me, the teachers who went far beyond the classroom doors, who spent time with me after school, who taught me to play basketball, who taught me what music was, who taught me that I could stand on stage and speak in front of a theater full of people, that I could lead the church choir if I wanted to, even though I can't sing. They loved me. And most importantly, they taught me to love others passionately. Thank you. Thank you very much, Estella, for a rather compelling argument. Um, OK, so we now have some time to take some questions from the audience. Um, OK, go ahead. Go ahead, could you, uh, could you introduce yourself and, and also say whether you want a question uh, for or against? Uh, my name is Fahad al Husseini. I'm from Cambridge University Press, and my question is for. Well, uh, I'm a little bit concerned about uh, when we maximize the role of robots in our life against the human aspect. So far, I highly appreciate what technology did to our life, and the best example I can give here is having my son sitting in the next room and sending me a text message, Dad, can I go out with my friends? So I'm also uh, highly appreciating what technology can actually do uh, in the teaching and learning process, particularly when you talk about the uh, cognitive domain, the psychomotor domain. But what about the affective domain? What about values? What about uh, 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 human interaction? I believe we are human by definition, and it's the human interaction, human relations, human emotions, human feeling that keeps us so. And I do believe that if robots uh, take like, or do 30% of our job, then we are 30% less a human. Okay. So, is the question clear? <laughs> yes, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Use robots with all technology. We're talking about robots, and nowhere in the argument uh, or explanatory notes were we asked to assume that robots would replace teachers. In fact, on the contrary, when robots support small group interaction, we give teachers more time for Justine, social interaction. I think there was something in the notes that did no? go into the teaching bit. No, nope. actually, what it said was robots will help us to address the worldwide shortage of teachers, and I quote, and the reason it will address the worldwide shortage of teachers is that the presence of robots in a classroom will bring in a new generation of teachers. More people, it will attract more young people to the teaching profession. It will not replace them. On the contrary, 
It will bring in young people who recognize that there is drudgery in some of teaching tasks, and that if that drudgery were taken care of by robots, they would have more time for love, passion, and social interaction with their students. Thank you. OK, we would like, um, Fred, you want to add something? Well, just to be sure that we are debating the same uh, motion, because it clearly says, because as I said in my introduction, um, that I reluctantly disagreed <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the motion for the simple fact that it clearly says with nearly 69 million additional teachers needed to meet the goals of universal education outlined in the SDG agenda, the rise of robots provides an unprecedented opportunity to accelerate educational progress, etc., etc., etc. So it's directly linked to a shortage of 60, almost 70 million teachers. Uh, you know, if that would not have been part of the motion, you know, you might not have found us in opposition of it. But let's stick to the text, please. Okay. The motion also says it's addressing a shortage. It's not replacing. Just to highlight this, but um, next question, please. I'll come to you. Um, could you state where you're from and whether you're asking a for or against question, please? I am Dr. Matthew from India. My question is, what does a robot... Is it a for or against question, please? No, the... Okay, the, fine. Thank you. What does a robot impart to the students? Data, information, knowledge, wisdom, or skill? The thing is that... Then next question is, <clears throat> how does a robot work? That is, linearly or non-linearly? or statically or dynamically, because it is related to knowledge. Knowledge structure is non-linear and dynamic. Data structure is linear and static. All robots are programmed or based on algorithm, based on data structure. That is linear and static. Therefore, a robot as such, until we develop a knowledge processing technology, we cannot replace teachers with robots. So have you got a question, or is that a statement? The question is, <laughs> how does a, a robot, well, what, what, do, what does a robot impart? Data, knowledge, information, wisdom, or skill? First question. Second question, how does a robot function, linearly or non-linearly? Okay. These are the two questions. Okay, so who would you like to question, uh, to answer the question, the for or the against count, or both? No, the, because I, I cannot, I cannot um, come to such a conclusion <laughs> so far, because... Yeah, okay, yeah, right, so... It is indeed hard to keep up with change in technology. And while 20 years ago, which may have been the last time from the sound of my opponent's arguments, that you looked at a robot, uh, they were, in fact, information delivery. Robot, not iPad. <laughs> um, they were, in fact, linear information deliverers, but that is not true today. Machine learning has made extraordinary gains in how robots work, and they are, in fact, dynamic. In fact, the work that I was asked to show at Davos this year in the only demonstration of technology in the Congress Hall in Davos was a robot that built a relationship with people and that demonstrated that that relationship was the social infrastructure that increased task performance as a personal assistant. On the outside of the booth, those who were not currently interacting with the robot could see what behaviors on the part of the human, eye gaze, head nods, um, smiles, uh, conversational strategies such as self-disclosure, had an impact on relational strength and what strategies the robot chose to illustrate its rapport and the effect that that rapport or relational strength had on task performance. That is an extremely dynamic task, and it's one that temporal association rules, a machine learning algorithm developed less than six months ago, allowed us to build. 
right. Um, so just to to what my opponent had said earlier, and a little bit to the question uh, in your argument, you mentioned uh, about a robot who could figure out who was on Facebook and doing stuff on social media. They're not supposed to be doing, but then I wonder, can that robot detect cyberbullying? And will that robot be able to counsel and hold the student who's now considering self-harm or suicide because of the cyberbullying that took place on Facebook? Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's a very open question. I'm not sure if it's an answer. Yeah, exactly. So, Dr. Dana Boyd has built exactly such a robot, which lives in chat rooms and which watches out for cyberbullying. And as soon as it detects it, it puts a stop to it and it counsels the student being bullied. I really um, advise that you look at the research in this area because it's wonderful. We have gone way past robots as simple replacements for information delivery. Once again. Okay, we have time for one more short question. Um, yeah, sorry, I've I'd already allocated a question over there. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I have a question for the opposition. Um, I just wanted to clarify what your opposition is. Is your opposition about stems from the thin end of the wedge. I mean, we've seen with uh, promises that technology would, as um, the, your, uh, Sir Steve, Michael was yeah. suggesting, um, would amplify teaching, for example, and make it easier. But with costs and austerity measures and so forth, is your objection um, that we'll start off with teaching assistance, but there'll be, as we move towards a more uh, subject-focused uh, curriculum, uh, content and so forth, that will end up actually sliding into replacement of actual teachers with robots. Is that, is that, the, is that the source of your objection? That's exactly our objection. Uh, that's the fear that we have. It's not the, the robots. I have you know, colleagues sitting here who would love to have one of your robots in their classroom. The point is that it should be used under supervision of a qualified teacher. That's the whole point. And forgive me, the, it's very clear there are 69 million additional teachers needed. So it's indeed not about replacing teachers because they're not yet there. There are 69 million extra teachers needed. And then it says, so robotics or robots in, in, the, in, the, in the class will, you know, help uh, improve education quality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I do not think that is true. Thank you. Okay, we now have a few minutes for both sides to give us a closing statement before... I'm afraid we're running out of time. <laughs> of the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain which tries to learn, which retrieves the data. There is another part, hippocampus, when they are, they are restored, and when there is a need, it is being retrieved. The robot cannot play the real role for human interaction. Paul Ekman from California, his extensive research, Madam, even the facial expression of a teacher, you know, inspires a student even a facial expression, how, how these functions can be conducted by a robot. I am against the robot. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to move to the closing argument now uh, because there's still, um, there are still things happening after this. So could I ask the four camp to come up with that closing argument, please? Our opponents... <laughs> unfortunately, have not let facts nor evidence influence their beliefs. And that's really the primary issue that I have with their argument, although it was very well enunciated and well argued, though false. For example, there is no evidence that shows that screen time has uniformly negative effects. On the contrary, there is evidence for and against and once again, these things are subtle 
and technology needs to be used for the right thing, and that's the role of the teacher. They are arguing against an argument that we were not asked to make, and I think I'll say no more about that because I think the audience believes in that. Um, one other point about facts, what the OECD found was that a computer alone does not give rise to learning gains. And they were responding to initiatives like one laptop per child and so forth, where shipping containers are dropped into countries with magical laptops that are supposed to improve without any help whatsoever, the learning of children. And that will never be the case. But they can take on the drudge work. The Finch costs $3 for each robot. There's a foundation that gives them away. And that's the case for much of the robotics that we're talking about, so the financial argument doesn't hold. So I would say in conclusion that if we actually take seriously the argument that we were asked to debate, and that is, will robots, the rise of robots in the classroom, improve education? I think that there is no doubt that it will. If we attend to what robots are good for, and we don't treat, as my colleague said, teachers like robots. If we also treat them like thinking, sensing, loving, motivating beings that they are, that we give them the benefit of education in the technology that they're using, and we give them the opportunity to pass off some of the work that robots can do so that they can concentrate on being the force for motivation for values, for substance in the classroom. Thank you. Thank you. OK, can I ask the opposition, please? Well, I, if, if, I, if I may start by saying that I do see some you know, differences between the two learned uh, opponents, because I believe that Sir Michael very clearly described teachers I believe in the United Kingdom, you mentioned grammar school teachers as acting like, like robots. So I, I, there is some difference between in, 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 in the defense of, of, um, of the motions. By the way, I think I know that the teachers of the UK sometimes think that it would be better to have robots as members of government and, and program in such a way that they finally give priority to education. But let's not go into, into, that, uh, into that direction. My point is very simple. The opponents seem to soften their, their motion, which is, you know, makes us very happy. Um, but it does clearly state that um, uh, technology entering the education sector will help confront teachers' shortages. I, there's no other interpretation uh, 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 possible. And that's why we spoke uh, against it. And as I've said, uh, te uh, technology, uh, robots, can help educators improve their professional performance. There's no you know, disagreement about that. And can help improve uh, learning outcomes. There's no disagreement about, about that. So um, the question is not whether we are for or against uh, uh, robots. By the way, I do have a robot at home. It's vac vacuuming. Um, it is for which purpose we are we are we are doing we are doing this it is being it is being uh, uh, used um, as long as the explanatory note stands i truly believe that this motion should be uh, rejected as expressing little confidence in the ability of the teaching profession to do its work with or without technology, sorry, robots. So I recommend, therefore, that we vote against it. Many thanks indeed. OK. <laughs> right, everyone, uh, it's back to clicker time. So if we go back to the motion, this house welcomes the rise of the robots in education. Um, if you'd like to use what? Uh, a for four, B against, or C for undecided. And you have now 15 seconds to vote, please.
Okay, we've got a bit of a swing here. The fall camp has gone up by 10%. The um, against has actually remained static. How is that possible? Is that 37 or is that... Oh, 33. They've gone up. So I beg your pardon, I couldn't read it very well on the screen. Yeah, so it's gone up by 1%. Yeah. And the undecided have dropped, as far as I can read, by 7%. So, therefore, the full camp has done it. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Have an enjoyable evening.